this might be the most exciting part of the entire day. I have to say that um, for many of you, you're probably here for this highlight. And of course, I was geeking out backstage and accosted our next speaker to sign my book. <laughs> so please welcome photographer, conservationist, National Geographic Fellow, and the founder of the Photo Arc, 2018 Rolex Explorer of the Year, and of course, a true visionary and hero for wildlife and the natural world, Joel Sartori. Hi, everybody. Greg, what should I say today? What do you think I should say? I guess we should talk about what's going on out there. What's the most recent stuff? Everybody wants to know, what's the number? Well, the number is 8,225 as of today. This was, this was our 8,000th shot in Porto, Portugal. This is a Perinian Desmond. You never heard of this guy. Uh, they are, they're either completely stopped as if they're dead or they're going a mile a minute. They're uh, insectivores, aquatic. They use that little trunk on the front of their heads as a snorkel, as a sensory organ to hunt down worms, the other aquatic invertebrates. They just eat them like I eat Hershey bars. They really go for it. Quite amazing animals. And uh, most people that, that have worked on this species have never seen one. So it was quite a big deal for them to catch one. They put tags on it, collars, did blood work, and let me photograph it in the middle of the night. Uh, more recently, as in last week, we were in the Philippines working on six different islands. Uh, thanks to funding from Geographic, uh, we got the Harpy Eagle. They crest when they're nervous or agitated, angry. This one would never crest. I guess we were too sweet. We tried to photograph. He's the only one in the world that is trained to ride on the fist. And so he's with a keeper all the time, hand raised. He went into our shooting tent. That beak's used for tearing monkeys apart, by the way. First thing we did there was we photographed this. It's called a tamarau. It's a dwarf water buffalo. It's the only one left in captivity. It's in a pasture. It's a very old male. Daughter Ellen is in the background there. These folks there had set up a basically a studio in the middle of this pasture. They drug a 220 volt generator up on skids behind a domestic water buffalo, and the animals was used to, was used to going in there eating for several weeks, maybe even months. Uh, this is the one we ended up going with. The, the tamarau's horns are very distinctive, and this is an animal that's at real risk of extinction, critically endangered, and so we. We shot him as if he was taking a bow. From there, we moved on to the Avalon Zoo. This is a very typical reaction from a cat when we put him in my little cloth shooting tent. Three minutes later, he's like this. <laughs> Two minutes after that, he's starting to fall asleep. Most of these animals we photograph are born and raised in human care. They're part of assurance colonies, like this tarsier. They're part of captive assurance colonies, making sure that they don't go extinct before people get smart enough to save the woods, the mangroves, the oceans. These, these places we go to, these zoos, aquariums, private breeders, wildlife rehabbers, they are the true arcs. Yeah, this is the photo arc, but these guys are the true arcs. They're saving animals for all of us until we realize that we have to have forests ourselves to survive and we need to protect giant tracts of habitat. This is, a, this is one of the remarkable things about, about zoos people don't realize is that they are conservation centers now, good zoos. Conservation centers, not simple menageries anymore. In fact, this female, she had lost her hoof in a poacher's snare. Uh, she would have been killed and eaten by any number of things, mainly people hunting them. Uh, the same warty pig, very rare. And yet she was saved by a rescue group, brought to the zoo, and now she's the leading breeder. She's had multiple dozens of piglets that are now being re-released into the wild. So zoos do great work, not to mention the conservation efforts that they do through education. Most zoos do a ton of education. This is a stink badger, by the way. They actually squirt a green goo out of their rump, and it smells just like a North American skunk, and it is nasty, <laughs> really bad. We photographed that one last. We don't just photograph cute and furry. We do, we do everything that we can. Nudibranchs, um, a grasshopper that carries this mechanism around on his back, so he blends in with uh, dead thorns on a bush, all the way to ants. Everything that you can see with the naked eye, 
We work in captive situations, but that's just so we can get pictures. It's very hard to convince a tiger to come out and lay on a background in the middle of a jungle. We go places where the animals don't have any choice, and uh, that's how we do it. This is why we're, we're a little bit anxious to hurry up. This is from 2011, uh, the mammalian biomass that exists on the Earth. The stuff we eat is in blue, cows and pigs, goats. On the left, people. Now this is 2011, so that green slice at the top, that's what's left in terms of wild mammals. And that slice has gotten a lot thinner since 2011. Seems to me we're talking about a lot of stuff at this conference, but we don't talk about the elephant in the room that's driving this animal to extinction, or this one, or this one. These have all gone extinct in the time we've done this project. What's the elephant in the room? Us. Almost 8 billion people. Jesus. Going to 10 or 11 billion. Boy, how do you stop that juggernaut? We're doing all we can, right? That's really, that's really a huge problem. Most encouraging thing I heard today was we're talking about contraception some with ladies in Uganda. That's, that's great. And who am I to talk? I've had three children. What a hypocrite, right? Totally. What do we do about this? I don't have good answers. I really don't. And I see extinction all the time. There's not a month goes by I don't meet face to face something that's, go that's going to go extinct imminently. This one actually is extinct now. We do these portraits on black and white backgrounds to try to get of a voice to everything. It ain't just about polar bears, even though the world would like it to be. It's about pahrumpf pool fish. It's about pangolins. It's about sturgeon with the most sensitive electronic ar array in their nostrum, in the rostrums, more incredible than any machine man's ever built. They can, they can locate prey in a number of ways with this extremely sensitive instrument in the most muddy, roiling water. They've survived millions of years. Endangered, of course, right? We try to do this with eye contact as best we can to get people to engage. We're primates, we react to eye contact, that's what draws us in. We can monitor what people are thinking now. The web is an incredible tool. It's a great time to be in conservation, actually, because we can reach so many people, but we can also read their minds. We can see how long they linger on things, how many likes, how many times these things are shared. We can literally read their minds. They like this. <laughs> they like things that look like us. They like anthropomorphic animals. They like them cute and weird. There's a long-eared jerboa. Hops, it's a mouse that hops around like a kangaroo with elephant ears. It lives at the Moscow Zoo. They love baby animals especially. So we feed people a steady diet of things that intrigue them that they want to share. And um, that works well for us. But we do, have to, we do have to slip in a message now and then, and we try to do that as frequently as we can uh, without turning people off. It seems like snakes, uh, rodents, people don't, don't dig that very much. If we do insects, we do them in a, in a really as colorfully as we can, just things that engage people, things that they want to share. This is about playing to the ego, isn't it? Sharing, liking. When you share something online, you are saying to somebody else, look at what I found. Look at how smart I am. Look at what a great hunter I am. I've brought this back to the cave for you. That's how it all works. It's very basic. So we play to that, whatever it takes to try to get people to pay attention. Uh, Year of the Bird, of course, right now going on, and um, uh, they're amazing. But then again, so is everything else we photograph. We try to love them all. We don't choose sides. We, uh, we figure that a cockroach counts just as much as an elephant. And that's a hard thing to say to a group of elephant biologists, which I've had to do before. <laughs> but they all, they all do count. Uh, primates especially. People really, really love primates. Um, I haven't really, still have not gotten a good picture of a chimp after all these years. This explains it a little bit. I can just hope. They're pretty strong. I hear they could rip your rip your uh, arm off and feed it, beat right. you to death with it, right? Exactly. Yeah, pretty much. So now, doesn't this look nice? Doesn't this look nice? Perfect. It's perfect for chimps. Always gets a laugh. Always gets a laugh. So one reason I'm very inspired is I meet people like all the fine folks we've seen here today uh, that, that are really reminding us what it's about, why it's so important. But I keep thinking about population. 
uh, was listening to Asha talk about blue whales and all those boats chasing down those blue whales. I was in Cebu two weeks ago in the Philippines and we took a morning to swim with the whale sharks. It was thousands of people in the water around these 14 animals, Chinese and, and Filipino tourists, and they're kicking you, and they're all trying to grab at these sharks, and it was, it was just very depressing. It was, it was 14 sharks and literally 2,000 people over the course of four hours, and uh, we're in rowboats, and it was just bedlam, and it was, it was inspiring to see the sharks, but it was very depressing to be a human being that morning. I just found it very... Wow, we are just pressing down so hard. And yet, we have to be inspiring. We cannot send out gloom and doom or people will just click. They'll go away from us. So we celebrate things like the whooping crane and the California condor and the Vancouver Island marmot and the Mexican gray wolf. Animals like the black-footed ferret. All of these got down to fewer than two dozen individuals and yet they're safe today. They're not out of the woods entirely, but safe today because of people who cared. Bred back, habitat restored. Public education campaigns brought these things back from the very brink of extinction. So I believe that if we help zoos, we help everybody, uh, National Geographic helps us, we get the lift we need, we can educate people as to what the needs are and they will respond. People love to fill a vacuum. They love to feel good about themselves. All plays to the ego, doesn't it? We give these pictures away free to whoever helps us to try to make these pictures go to work go to work long after we're all dead and gone, for decades and decades. We want this to be a permanent archive, Geographic's the home of it, and we want the zoos to run with these things. We want everybody to run with these things. That's really the goal. It isn't so I have something to do till I die. Um, the Houston Zoo has been a big supporter early on, and then when Geographic came on board, and they had come on board a long time ago, story after story through the magazine with Kathy Moran as my editor, uh, she knew I would moonlight and shoot photo arc portraits wherever I was sent. And then once Geographic came on board as a full sponsor, wow, the lift you get is tremendous. Reasons for hope, for sure. We have a, we have a, big, uh, a big campaign to get together and try to save species. The Outdoor Advertiser Association of America has been putting these up on billboards all over the country, bus stops, subways, and now it's spreading um, internationally as well, which is great. And then, you know, talking about the need to keep this top of mind for decades, a decades-long campaign. We have to make this interesting and fun. That's how you do it. Luis de Hoyos, who did the movie The Cove, he asked to use some of the stills and videos on buildings. I said, sure, go ahead. And he really ran with it. And these, these things became the number one trending topics on social media for days afterward. But it has to be really entertaining, really interesting. I guess I, would, I guess I would close with this. For those of you thinking that, well, if we just educate the next generation, they'll take it from here. They'll do a better job than we did. I think it's maybe the opposite. For the next generation, they're really stuck to these screens and they don't get out much. There's no place for them to go. And even if they could go someplace, they don't really want to get off the internet. They don't want to get away from video games. The people in this room, I would argue, are some of the most important people in this entire city right now. And none of them come to work at Geographic without feeling that sense of obligation and nobility here. The fact is Geographic has shifted into a conservation group into a, in a major way. That's critical, that's critical. So I would ask you this, at the end of your lives, in your declining hours when you look in the mirror, what are you gonna see? Who are you gonna see? You're gonna see somebody who, who really, really did as well
well as they possibly could to save the future of life on Earth? Are you? I'm trying to do everything that I can. How about you? Joel Sartori, everybody. And now to moderate our panel discussion, the Senior Director International for National Geographic Society in Latin America, Gael Almeida and the five fellows from the Photo Art Project. <laughs> everybody I'm so excited to be here I think it's the first time I see so much Latino power on stage which is just amazing <laughs> and it's this panel is going to be amazing because it's going to be the first time we hear about the work that the first group of photo arc edge fellows is doing uh, we were lucky that this group is coming from Latin America, so they are all working in Latin American countries. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you, Lenny. thank you. And each of them is working with a species that is part of the photo arc, and, and that is also, uh, let me see if I can say the edge, uh, the edge word correctly, is a evolutionary distinct and globally endangered species. So it's not that they were randomly picked. There's an intention behind it. And I have to say that after hearing the award ceremony yesterday, it is like incredible to see the amazing work they are doing. They're working with communities, with their local communities, engaging the local communities, and really trying to change the status of all of these species. And I also want to thank uh, the set of cell because we're doing this project in partnership with them. So thank you so much. I know you're somebody out there from the set of cell. Uh, so we will do this session differently from the other panels. This is gonna, it's gonna be more of an interactive session. So we will go from north to south. And I will ask Joel if you can give us an uh, anecdote about taking this photo of this beautiful species minute on each animal I'm supposed to talk about. <laughs> so um, for this, the volcano rabbit, I remember going to the Mexico City Zoo. It was really hot, and there were very few of them. They, they are really, really threatened by our pets, dogs and cats. All rodents are, actually. Um, if you want to save birds in your neighborhood, if you love birds, put your cat inside your house and never let that cat outside again. Even if they're declawed, they are efficient killing machines. Thank you. So we will hear for our first fellow. Her name is Yajaira Garcia. Yajaira works in Mexi near Mexico City in the volcano area, and she works to save the volcano rabbit, better known in Mexico as Zacatuche. So go ahead, Yajaira. Thank you, Gael. Uh, when we think in a rabbit, uh, the majority of the people think that rabbits don't have problems because they reproduce like a rabbit, <laughs> and they are so <laughs> common and abundant. But that's not the truth for all the species. One example is the volcano rabbit or Zacatuche, as Gael said. And this species only has two young per leader, so uh, its fecundity is so low. In addition of this, uh, this species has many problems. There are a lot of threats. One of these is that its distribution is so restricted. Uh, its habitat is only in the pine forests of bunch grasses, with bunch grasses that are distributed in the slope of mainly four volcanoes in the Valley of Mexico. And the other threats are because of the activities human, caused by human. Uh, for example, the urban development is one of these. The agricultural activities, cattle grazing, burning, logging, hunting, feral dogs, cats and feral dogs, and in the future, the climate change. So we have a great challenge because its habitat and this species is decreasing time by time. 
And the other and not the least more important is that many people don't know about volcano rubbing. And also the local people think that these species don't have problems, that they, there is another rabbit that is common. And for that reason, with the National Geographic Society and the Zoological Society of London, we want to implement a monitoring program with the local people, the owner of the land. And we want to train in all these people in different activities like radio tracking. And with the children, we want to implement and our awareness activities. So we think that we can only conserve this beautiful and cute species if we can work together. Thank you. Thank you, Yahaira. What about this photo, George? Look, it's a bear tapering. So I could, ta I could tell you a, a boring story about how I photographed this at the Omaha Zoo, it's a great zoo. I could talk about the fact that they're relegated to the mountains now. They used to be in the lowlands too, but people, they're big meaty animal. But what I want to talk about is the lady I met who was a taper keeper at a zoo in Oklahoma. She had a plastic arm. And I said, what happened? She said, well, the taper I was taking care of ripped it off. <laughs> but it wasn't a Baird's taper, it was a Malayan taper, so go ahead. <laughs> So let me introduce you, Marina Rivero. Marina Rivero is from Mexico, and she's working in the southern part of Mexico in the state of Chiapas with a tapir. Go ahead. Thank you, Gail. So uh, I took this photo uh, when I was working in the wild, and it was in June, this year, January this year. And it took me almost seven years on being in the, in the field and working with wildlife. To keep, take this picture in Costa Rica because in Mexico it's getting harder and harder to see these animals in the wild because they are hi highly threatened. So tapers are called living fossils because uh, they had been on the earth for almost 30 million years. So, uh, but today only four species are left. So this is the bird tapir and uh, this species uh, were, uh, lives from uh, South Mexico to North Colombia and it has been estimated that we have around 3,000 individuals in the wild. Um, uh, well, the, yeah, in Mexico, one of the smallest population uh, is located in the Sierra Madre de Chiapas, which is the region where I work. Uh, the main threat for the species there are poaching, habitat loss, and fragmentation. So, uh, yeah, so I know that we are the problem, that we are causing the reduction of the wildlife populations, but we are also the solution. So um, in order to conserve and to protect the tapirs, uh, we need and we must work with local communities. So that's why I developed the Tapires de la Sierra project with the uh, help of National Geographic and the Zoological Society of London uh, to uh, identify like the main uh, critical areas where the tapirs are more vulnerable and to poaching and habitat loss. So we can direct the, the conservation effort to these areas. Uh, I'm also, uh, I have a, a, a community monitoring program since 2015. Uh, so, and we are uh, uh, training these local people so they can learn how to use camera traps and they can uh, learn the basic concepts of biological uh, monitoring. And finally, we are developing uh, an an environmental uh, education campaign so the kids from the uh, from the Sierra Madre de Chiapas can learn more about the species and know how to do how to protect these species. Thank you, Marina. <laughs> this is an Antillan manatee, I think, and um, I was uh, locked overnight in the Dallas World Aquarium, which takes up a full city block in downtown Dallas. I was staying in the apartment they have, but I couldn't get out, and so I couldn't sleep. And so I wandered through the aquarium, and I had a single flash on a camera, and they have, it, uh, they have a big tube, a tunnel you walk through, acrylic, and this animal is sleeping on that tunnel. And so the first flash woke him up, <laughs> and the second flash, he started to s drift up, and I got a picture, and he swam off, and that's the only picture I have of Antillan and Manatee, and I'm glad it's in focus. Yeah. <laughs> So our next speaker is Jamal Galvez. Jamal Galvez was in the, works in the west coast of Belize, and he works to save the West Indian manatee. So Jamal. I'm a proud Belizean. 
I grew up in a very small village in Belize named Gills Point, Manantes, famously known for the Manantes there. As a kid, I always knew about Manantes, but I never knew that they were in trouble. At the age of 11, I used to observe the researchers boat go by my grandparents' house. So we're looking boat. Made me really curious. So I showed up at the dock one morning and I said to the crew, I want to come out with you guys. The leader looked at me and he said, you're too small. <laughs> I mean, I was 11 years old. I don't know if it's my I'm about to cry face that made him change his mind and say, ah, kid, let's go. <laughs> but what I'm sure of is that I never asked my grandparents permission, which had some consequences. <laughs> and this is where my journey began, being the Manantee best friend, and this is where it brought me. Thanks to National Geographic and the Zoological Society of London, I'm using my project, combined effort of conservation effort educational and awareness, targeting stakeholders and working close with my stakeholders to try and improve the sustainability, the viability, and the productivity of the endangered manatees in Belize and their habitat for the benefit of both wildlife and human livelihoods. Thank you. Hawksbill turtles. This was at a rescue center, actually, in Mexico on the East Coast. Um, the thing I think about these, these, these turtles every time, these sea turtles, is that their shells help lead to their demise. You know, a lot of turtles are eaten. Uh, this is a small, sometimes these are collected as very small animals to use things, to make beautiful objects out of their shells, and that's still a threat. And it's, it's too bad they're so pretty, isn't it? Yeah. So our next speaker is Daniel Arauz. Daniel Arauz is from Colombia and works in the coast of Colom in the co Colombia, Costa Rica. I saw you from Colombia. <laughs> He's from Costa Rica and he works in the coast of Costa Rica with Hawksbill turtles. Well, thank you, Gail. Um, well, I think I'm a very lucky guy since both of my parents are also sea turtle biologists and are hopefully watching us on the live stream all the way back in Costa Rica. So, hi, mom. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> <Yay>! <laughs> So basically the first steps that I took were patrolling the beaches of Costa Rica with my parents looking for sea turtles. And as growing up, I heard a lot of times that of the four species of sea turtles that we have in Costa Rica, I will probably never get to see a hawksbill live since illegal poaching and unsustainable fisheries were bringing these species to regional extirpation in the whole Eastern Pacific Ocean, where now there's estimated to be only 500 nesting females left in the whole, east, in the whole region. So fast forward a little bit more, when I was 20 years old, I was the research assistant for a group of very dedicated biologists exploring the whole coast of Central America, looking for critical places to protect uh, in order to, to ensure the survival of these species. Now I'm leading this project where we not only discovered that a small and fragile juvenile population of Hawksbill sea turtles are using our waters to feed and grow, we are also tagging them and tracking them using different techniques to follow their movements, to learn where they are going, where they are coming from. And just as we learned from Pablo yesterday, I'm also taking kids from the local communities to these waters to swim with these turtles, to connect with these animals, and to get mesmerized by their beauty so that we can you know, enforce the government authorities to create and manage new marine protected areas in the Pacific coast of Costa Rica. Thank you. And the giant anteater, this was photographed at the Caldwell Zoo in Texas. What's amazing is uh, when the baby is riding the mother, the stripes line up, and you can't really see at a distance that she's carrying young. Um, I learned that firsthand. I saw, I was doing a story for the Geographic on the Pantanal in Brazil, and I saw some grasses moving, and the grass kept moving in one spot. So, of course, eager to get a picture, I ran, ran right up. And what's amazing is a mom with a baby on her back can stand up and try to eviscerate you with her big claws on her front, front end. So I kept going. I didn't get any pictures that day at all. So last but not least, Vinicius Alberici is from Brazil. I'm not going to change nationalities again. He's from Brazil, and he's working with the giant anteater. Thanks. So giant anteaters are pretty unique, right? And they are unlike any other animal that I have ever seen in the wild. And the first time I saw one, I was in Brazil, which I think is the best place to be if you're looking for them. And I was fascinated about everything. So they are bigger than they look. 
and they have this huge front claws, so you don't want it to, go, to get too close. But also their smell and even the sound that they make. And I just kept thinking, you know, how can this animal still be here? And giant anteaters are facing local extinction, both in Central and South America. And in fact, in the last decade, almost 30% of the population uh, decreased. So, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so the major threats to the species right now are habitat loss and fragmentation, and also fires, and roadkill. And in Brazil, they are one of the top species killed on roads. So last year, we started the Ant Eaters and Highways project, and we want to understand, to quantify, and to mitigate the impacts of roads on giant anteaters populations. And to do that, we are using camera traps and GPS tracking device, and we are also working with the local communities and with the government to develop a long-term conservation plan for the species in Brazil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I know this is big effort. I know that for some of you is the first time they are at stage, so I would like to ask for another. <laughs> so before I turn it to the audience to do some questions, I would like to do some questions to the five of you. And I will start by Marina and Vinicius. So how much has the use of these photos and, and other videos from your camera traps have helped you to really inspire action in the communities that you work with? So I'd like to yeah. start. Like, um, so I w two weeks before I came here, I was in La Sierra Madre Chiapas working, uh, putting some camera traps, and the community monitors there just asked me, like, Marina, we ca can we uh, show the people from the community, like, the photos and the videos that we have been uh, gathering from the camera traps uh, since 2015? And I was said, like, okay, let's do it. So they get the canyon, the projector, and we make, like, this night of, of videos and, and images, and it was, like, incredible to... to to see like the the faces of the people there because they were like so happy to see these animals walking in front of the camera traps and and, and these cameras are in, in their forest so they were like super happy to have to have this like this information and, and eventually like, they were telling like how can we what can we do to to, to conserve these species no like they are very engaged so how about you Vinny? Uh, yeah I agree with Marina and you know just this week we are well, all at uh, schools here in DC. And one kid asked me, what does the giant anteater have in common with humans? And I, and I told them about the, the baby and the, the fact that the mother carries the baby for the first year of the baby's life. And the kids love that. And I know that children get excited about everything, right? <laughs> and I feel like <laughs> as we grown up, we kind of lose that, that ability of be amazed with the world around us. And I truly believe that Joe's pictures can help us to bring that back. And that is like the first step to make people care. So, Jahaira and Jamal, uh, how important has been adding this storytelling component to plus the scientific work that you're doing in your conservation project? Well, um, I consider that it is the, I'm not sure if the only, but it's just the, the best way that we have to get the attention of the people. Many people don't know about these amazing animals and these stories, and if we can tell them all about these animals, its streets, and the different problems that are facing, we can get its attention. Mm -hmm. And if we get its interest, we can involve them in the different activities of conservation. I think it's, it's a, a really necessary tool that we need to implement both elements. I think it's really, really important. I think there's no other way about it. Um, like the title of the panel says, every animal deserves a, deserves a story. 
as scientists, we may collect data and sit on a boat and take all these equipment, and that's okay, but if we cannot collect the information and transform it in a way that the lay person can understand, people that are actually causing the problem make that, that can contribute to making the change, then we're, we're wasting our time. We're doing it the wrong way. We need to start all over because we need to be able to take that data and translate it to the, to, the, to the people so that they can see how they can be a part of it and let them realize that they can be a part of change. Um, change is not only for scientists and for, for researchers, they're for the normal person, for the individuals that throw garbage in the waterways, setting nets in the areas and teach hang out. Change requires a one world, one people effort. Thank, Thank you. you. Danny. After these six months of experience of being part of this fellowship uh, and being trained on storytelling techniques, how much have you incorporated that component into the work you're doing? So, well, just like Jamal was saying, I believe that one of the greatest challenges of the scientific community right now is to be able to deliver our information in an understandable way for the general public. So, you know, we need to be able to be able to tell a compelling story that moves people to try to change and work with us. And you know, for me it's been very helpful using Joel's pictures and using all that we have learned during this experience to be able to go to the local communities, to the kids, to everyone, people with no education, mm -hmm. and be able to touch them and to motivate them to you know, start moving and start protecting stuff. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. So Joel, how do you feel about this first cohort of photo arc fellows and seeing that it's actually happening. Fantastic. And see, this isn't so bad sitting up here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, they, they might even buy you lunch. I don't know. <laughs> it's all right. Good. Thank you. You guys all did a great job and you continue to do a great job. And I have a question about the baby manatee. Can you tell us the story about how that baby landed in your arms? You have a, a red spout from a milk bottle in one hand and you're caring for this animal. I would just love to know the, the backstory of that. That baby manante, we named her, named him Lucky, because he was a lucky animal. Manante don't normally look that way, they normally pull the wrong baby. You can see the flags and the lo lobes, it's because it's really dehydrated, haven't eaten in a while, been separated from its mother, but it was, on a, it was at an abandoned beach, and this guy coincidentally went to this beach, and there's this manante lying on the shore, waiting to die. He jumped on his bicycle and rode to my mom's house because he knew who I am and to tell my mom to call me immediately. So she called me and I went immediately and I saw that man and I was, I'd never seen a man and look that bad, such a bad condition. And the reason why I named her Lucky, him Lucky, because it's a lucky animal. It's a really, really, truly lucky animal and these animals, not because they can't speak, it doesn't mean that they don't have something to say. We are a voice for these animals, so to speak up, to let them know what's happening, and like the boot camp, the story boot camp, like Greg taught us to sing out like Louise. <laughs> um, if you want to be heard, you got to speak up, and mm -hmm. our goal is to spread the word, and that's why I mentioned I'm grateful for National Geographic and for The Edge for giving us, giving us this platform, giving us this opportunity to to get our word, get our work on the map, make people know that there are animals in other parts of the world that need your help. Thank you. So we have time to take some questions from the audience. I don't know if somebody has, we have one here, one down here. My question is uh, addressed to Joe. I have two questions for you. You mentioned uh, a number, 8,421 or whatever that number was. What is the end number? That's my first question, if, if we know what it is. And my second question is if you could comment a little bit about the duration it takes to take one of those incredible photos, what is the shortest and the longest? Sure, uh, the, the world zoos, aquariums, private breeders and wildlife rehabbers, which is mostly where we work, they house currently between 12 and 15,000 species, we think. That number will decline 
over the next few years because many animals don't breed in captivity and so what we're seeing right now are the very last generations of these animals because they they can't be pulled anymore from the woods for various reasons some of them don't exist in the wild anymore uh, some of it's politically incorrect some of these animals could contain bird flu so we're going to see the numbers of animals in captivity contract at the same time our numbers are going up and we'll we'll likely meet them at 13 or 14,000 I think that's the best guess in terms of duration of shoots uh, we did a pig in the Philippines that was 56 seconds. They'd prepped this space in black. Uh, they'd practiced with him three times. And, um, and after, after 56 seconds, he hopped over the little wall that was there, and, he, and that was that. So um, then we did another pig three days later, and the shoot was 13 seconds long. It's because he wouldn't come up to the background anymore. That was, I mean, we had 13 seconds, and we got four frames, and that's it. For many birds, we'll photograph them for uh five or six frames maybe 10 images on each color and that takes a minute or two uh for some animals that are like primates that are enjoying extra bananas that day um <laughs> maybe it's 15 or 20 minutes just depends on the animal and, and um, how they're reacting really but we work really closely with the zoos and the animals keepers they know the personalities of most of these animals and we ask before and i say is this animal sweet is it nervous? Is it hyper? Is it what's what's it like? And we try to get that understanding before the animals ever brought into photographs. So so far so good. And um, we figure another fifteen years we'll we'll get done. There was one down here and the other one there. Uh, another question for Joel: uh, What's your plan B to take the next photo of a, a chimpanzee again? Oh, I try not to think about chimps too much, actually. <laughs> I don't have a plan B. I tried again at Singapore, at Wildlife Reserve Singapore, at Singapore Zoo, and I got two pictures. It's a, they, have a, they had a white room, and there's an uh, a, a adult female and a juvenile, a three-year-old. And the uh, first picture is them both looking at me, kind of boring, and the second picture is her jumping up to the ceiling and yelling at me. And so that was, <laughs> it was a 10-second shoot. So... Still nothing really very intimate. I'm also not working with animals that are trained for the movie business or anything. These are animals that are just, that are just there, and um, so I'm not in any rush, really. It makes a much funnier story when you say you still haven't gotten a good picture of a chimp. <laughs> so maybe we'll leave it at that. So you each talked about working with young children and getting them inspired to care about the animals. What are some steps young children can take to maybe follow in your footsteps and pursue a career in this area? <laughs> I'm doing the translation. <laughs> Just like to do it, like they, I didn't imagine that I will be like sitting here, like I thought like they can do whatever they want to do, like just go ahead and, and they will do it, like yeah. So to add to Marina is that um, you're never too young, I always tell kids you're never too young to start. It's not a starting point. There is a finishing point, though, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but you're never too young to start. Um, don't just dream, believe. Um, kids are easily inspired. Yeah. And to be honest, they're the last hope for this planet. And they make me optimistic in the sense that they, they are excited about conservation. They're excited to go and do a cleanup. They're excited about these things. And they're the ones that are going to save this planet. And it is our responsibility to to give them the knowledge that they need in order to do that. Otherwise, we better teach them survival. <laughs> so, yeah, there's one question here. Can I add a little something while we're waiting? Yeah. I bet you none of you guys had anybody walk up to you and say, hey, you know, we've got this opening on our team for a hawksbill turtle specialist, right? <laughs> no, I mean, you all, you all saw a need and you filled it. And that's really important for any young people that are watching today is, it, don't think somebody else is going to do it. All these guys up here made their own ways. They just were very passionate about something, became an expert on it, and studied for years and worked for years and years and years. And you get free lunch out of the yeah. deal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's paying off. So all of you are outstanding storytellers, and one aspect of storytelling is sound. What do your animals sound like? Ooh. What does a volcano <laughs> sound like? Okay. That's for the kids. Awesome. Yeah. Well, the volcano rabbits is the only rabbit that can make a sound. 
and it's like <laughs> <All right. laughs> so papers make like. <laughs> my my go. <laughs> well, I, I will disappoint you because <laughs> they live in the water. They don't do any vocalizations, but you know. <laughs> Hopefully, like a T-Rex, you know. Like <laughs> <laughs> of course. You're bad, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. And so giant anteaters are usually quiet as well, but when we capture them, they get angry and they just blow the, the, the air to their snout and it's like, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like, like a bear. And, and yeah. like in Spanish, they call it also hormigueros, which is literally means like ant bear. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, if there are no, not any more, I, I have one question over there. Yep. Hi. Um, yeah, so I have kind of a different question. Um, this is something that I've thought about and something that I find other people uh, who I'm trying to convince uh, that there's a real problem because uh, a lot of people in this room are very aware of that, but uh, I feel like we're the minority uh, a lot of the times. And 99.9% um, .9 of all species to have ever existed are extinct. And so there's this sort of balance that I have to find where I explain that we're going to see that. We're going to continue to see that. But how, how can we demonstrate, you know, your arc? It's a, it's a beautiful thing. I'm a photographer. I'm shooting this, this event and uh, love your work. But I, I, I find this sort of difficult way to find how, how do I explain to someone that, yeah, we're going to have this extinction. We're going to have these species go out. But there's a, you know, there's a fine line between it, it's a problem and it's sort of what what's expect expected. So how do you sort of quantify that? How do you explain that to people who I'm sure have approached you with that problem? Can I jump all over that one? Go ahead. The rate's a thousand times higher right now, man. A thousand times higher. We need these other, these other species to ex exist, especially, especially Dr. Raven's specialty, which is plants. We lose plants. We lose vast stretch stretches of rainforest that regulate our climate and our rainfall. We are in huge mm -hmm. trouble. So. You can get people fired up about this if you say, I don't know, do you like living on the planet? <laughs> you want to survive yourself? You explain to them how, how, I don't know, pollinating insects work and they bring you one third of every bite of food you eat and the, and the loss of the rain, so rainforest, the collapse of the oceans, the acidity that's taking away the coral, which takes away the fish that people need to eat. You can get into the weeds with them if they want to go there, but usually if you say the rate's a thousand times faster and it jeopardizes humanity. I mean, it's jeopardizing it right now. So you just get into that. And if they want to argue further, great. Great. Thank you. So to end this panel, we're going to do one idea that Danny had to, uh, to, to close the panel. And I'm going to ask the five of you to tell us what we can do as an audience to help you save the species that you're working with. So we can begin with Vinicius over there so that we turn it. So I just want to say that if you want to know more about what we are doing to help the giant anteater, you can uh, look for our project, the Anteaters and Highways Project, on, in social media, and also go to giantanteater.org. And please help me to make these species better known, because a lot of people have misconceptions about them. And also, next time you're driving, think about how can we make roads safer for wildlife and for, for ourselves. So, thank you. Right. Okay, so 1,500 sea turtles are killed every year by the Costa Rican fishing fleet. So, I really want to encourage you to become better consumers. We have talked a lot about the plastics, but as Sylvia mentioned the other day, overfishing and the unsustainable use of our oceans could be, together with plastic use, the biggest threat to our oceans. Um, so I really want to encourage you, if you like eating seafood as much as I did, um, ask yourselves, where is your food coming from? Where is this tuna coming from? How was it caught? And how many sea turtles and other animals were killed in order for me to get this little shrimp in my plate? Because clearly this is not a sea turtle issue, but an ecosystemic issue that all our oceans are facing. Thank you. Yeah. There is just one thousand manatees left in Belize. One. That's the last stronghold. 
Man and these are literally fighting for their life. It's not a fight that they can fight alone. It's not one that will, it's one that will take more than just conservationist effort. And the few people that actually cares about Manantis, it will require one world, one people's effort to change their behavior, whether it be throwing garbage in the waterways, setting nets in, in, in Mananti areas, or speeding boats in Mananti areas. But, but contributing isn't just donating, it's sharing a post on Facebook, writing a letter of encouragement. People like us sometimes get discouraged and we need and we depend on the support of humans alike to support us to propel going forward. Thank you. So I would like, like you to transmit uh, information about papers that you talk about papers because they are really not well known. And also uh, try to reduce like, for example, your consumption of, of meat because they, we are changing like forest for cattle ranches. So we're, we're literally ending up this, this forest because of, because of this activity. So if you can think about it, if you want to meet or you had something else, like try to reduce this. Yeah. We cannot uh, take care of what we don't know. So I invite you to share our stories, the story about Volcano Ravi. Um, if you want to get more information about how actions we are going to do in with the conservation program of Volcano Ravi, I invite you to visit our page. All of us has a, a blog and we are uh, posting information. And another thing that I consider is very important, as Joel said, uh, feral dogs, cat, uh, cats, and, fer and feral dogs, cats and feral dogs, yeah, mm -hmm. sorry, okay. <laughs> uh, is a big problem. So I invite you to care our pets. <laughs> Please don't live out our houses and continue with our jobs and work with us. Thank you. Thank you. you want to say something? No, they said it great. You guys did great. See, nothing to worry about. <laughs> Should have seen them in the green room, man. <laughs> All's well. Thank you, guys. Thanks for all Thank that you, you do. Thank you so much. For all <laughs>